Well, oh, yep, sure is. <laughs> it's live. Shut up. I just want to make sure the audio is connected to it. I'm not going to use any, so oh, okay. it'll be okay. Then I'll leave this as is. Cool. Because I see they still have their laptop. Oh, yeah, yeah, they have that one too. All right, thank you. so much for coming to this very first early session today. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good? All right, cool. Um, so this is going to be talking about automating stateful applications with Kubernetes operators. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Jan Kleiner. I, I got loud. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. I focus on OpenShift, um, which is a distribution of Kubernetes. Um, and while we're not going to be talking about, just generically talking about Kubernetes today, I do want to lay the groundwork before we start talking about operators um, to make sure that everybody in the room has at least some fundamental understanding of Kubernetes, the Kubernetes API, um, and some of the different types of primitive types and entities that are available. But just to be sure, how many folks in this room already feel like you're pretty familiar with Kubernetes? Because if it's every single person, no, every single person. Okay, we're going to go through at least a little bit then just to make sure that you have a foundation so the rest of the talk makes sense. Um, so what is Kubernetes? Basically it is an open source orchestra orchestration system for managing containerized workloads. So if you are running applications, services, and containers and you need to do that at scale in an automated way, Kubernetes is a great uh, way of helping you do that. So what are some of the types of things that it will help you do? So there's a lot of stuff written up here, and that's not even half of it, but some of the things it can help you with deployments. It can help you um, simplify the process of, of handling networking and routing so that you can access the applications that are running from outside the cluster. Um, it can do health checks and also recovery if there's failures. All sorts of things um, can happen in a fairly automated way so that you don't have to manage all of this and kind of figure out your own systems for, uh, for taking care of it. To get a little bit more detailed, um, I wanted to talk about some of the main object types in Kubernetes. And the reason for this is not because I need you to know about all of them, but it's so that when we talk in a little bit more detail about operators, you can understand how that relates to the primitive object types in Kubernetes. So you see th here, things here listed like pod and service, deployment. These are some of the, the core pieces um, and types of objects that will be in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and anytime you're interacting with basically anything in Kubernetes, you're using the Kubernetes API in some form. Whether you're using the API directly and running curl commands, or if you're using kubectl, the command line interface, all of I got a little, I get to talk with my hands a lot, so I'm going to try not to do that. Um, all of those things are using or on top of the Kubernetes API. So that's a really key critical piece of the whole system. So when you're working in Kubernetes, one of the things that's kind of unique about it is that you are typically, you're describing your desired state of the system, and Kubernetes is doing all of the work kind of behind the scenes to try to bring the actual state in line with your desired state. So if you're saying, I want to deploy this application, um, here's the container image I want to use, and I want three replicas of it. So I want three pods running with this application, and whatever other things you want. Um, you're just going to put that information into a spec, which is part of this object definition. Let me go ahead and show you kind of an example. So this is like an excerpt of what um, an object definition for a pod might look like. You can see there's some metadata, like the name of it, what kind it is at the top. You can see the kind is pod in this case. And then the spec is what I want to, to make sure that we're, we're thinking about a little bit before we talk about operators. The spec is where you're defining what your desired state is. And then Kubernetes is constantly going through the process of trying to reconcile the actual state with, um, with your desired state. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I just want to at least introduce that concept before we start talking about operators. 
but we're not here to talk just about Kubernetes in general. We're here to talk about operators. And before getting into the details of you know, what operators actually are and how they work and how to use them, I wanted to first introduce why should you care about them in the first place? What, what is it that they're, what problem are they solving? What is it that they're bringing to the table that, that you might not have already? So that's where we're going to start. Um, as you may know, scaling stateless applications in Kubernetes is easy. There's not a whole lot to it. In fact, there's um, primitive types like replica set that can handle all this for you. So if you were to run this command, for example, um, kubectl scale, and you pass in what it is that your, your application here, and then how many replicas, it's going to handle that for you and scale it up to three. So how does that work? So here you can see kind of an example. This would be like the starting state. So you're using kubectl, which is on top of the Kubernetes API. You want to scale it up, your application. Your desired state would be you want three. Currently, we're over here. We have one instance of that pod running. When you run that command, Kubernetes is going to do whatever it has to do to spin up two additional pods um, with your application running. And so that's just happened for you. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, um, there's not a whole lot that you, as the user, have to think about or know. You just say, hey, I want three, and you get three. So what about applications that store data? Um, scaling stateless applications is easy. Um, applications that store data might be a little bit more complex. Um, you can think about things like a database where you might they might have their own notion of a cluster. So you're running in your Kubernetes cluster, but maybe you're running something like um, Redis Enterprise or something like that that has its own notion of a cluster as well. That introduces some complexity um, to the system. But in general, in Kubernetes, creating a database is easy. So say you have some imaginary database here. Um, all you have to do is tell it what to run, pass it the, the image for what you want to run, and it will get it up and running for you. And the real complexity comes in when you're trying to run and maintain things like databases or stateful applications over time. And um, that's where we're going to head in that direction now. So what are some of those considerations that make this harder? So pretty much any complex application is going to have to deal with these type of actions as you run them and manage them over time. So you know, if you have something like a Redis Enterprise cluster or an etcd cluster or something running on Kubernetes, you may need to resize it over time. Maybe the demands on your system have changed. Um, for sure, you're going to have to upgrade or patch if there's some sort of vulnerability that comes out and you need to, to update the version that you're using. You may need to reconfigure things. Um, if what you're running has, stores data, you may need to back up that data for some reason. Um, or things always go wrong. So dealing with healing, you know, something crashes, what do you do? in that case when you've got this application running in a distributed system, how do you handle that? Those types of things are a little more complex than saying create this database and um, there's additional complexity that comes in when you're running on, on a system like Kubernetes. So basically when it comes down to it, what are you trying to say? You may only have to install something once, um, but you're going to have to kind of continually deal with configuration, management, and upgrades over time, um, particularly as things like patches come out and you have to find some way of getting that applied in your system. Patching, of course, is critical to security, and running secure applications is critical to any business. And when it comes down to it, anything that's not automated is slowing you down. All of those things that we described, handling upgrades, handling you know, failures and recovery and backup, all of those generally are going to take some interaction from a person, right? They're going to take time from somebody's day. They're going to, somebody's going to have to have noticed that that ha problem happened in the first place and then have the knowledge and the time and the skills to take care of the problem and do whatever is necessary. Um, and all of those things, they do slow down the process of deploying and delivering your application, whatever it is that you're trying to do. So what can we do about it? If only Kubernetes knew. Kubernetes knows how to automate lots of things already, right? Well, what if it knew all of that operational knowledge for how to manage these, you know, say a database or your complex application in Kubernetes already? What if it knew how to do that for you as well? So here is our imaginary uh, coworker, John. He has worked at your company for about five years, and he 
knows everything there is to know about running, we're going to call it production-ready database. It's not just some imaginary database. He knows what it takes to get it um, deployed on your Kubernetes clusters. He knows what it has to be done when you need to upgrade. He's got all that operational knowledge. He's experienced. He's done this for a long time. Um, He's the person that everybody in your organization is going to come to if they need a database deployed or if they need some of these operational tasks done. All of that's going to come to John. The problem is, he's really good at what he does, but there is only one of him. Um, everybody needs his time, and some organizations aren't even going to be able to have a dedicated resource like him. So they may not even be able to run applications like this um, because they just don't have that operational knowledge. So what if we could take all of that knowledge and experience um, that John has about how to run and maintain and upgrade and manage these applications, this database over time, um, and put it in a box? That's very simplistic, but just imagine that we could do that. We can take his operational knowledge and put it in a box. All right. Then, if we could do that, then we could take that um, that operational knowledge, this software version of basically all of this this information that he has in his brain, and we could deploy that on any Kubernetes cluster, in any organization, in any cloud, and you could have that production-ready database running and managed in a production uh, suitable manner anywhere. And so what we're really talking about there is what operators are trying to provide. Um, so they are basically automated software managers that handle the installation and lifecycle for Kubernetes applications. And when we say Kubernetes applications, that can mean kind of a few different things, but what, what I'm trying to describe here is it's an application that runs on Kubernetes but also has some like touch points into the Kubernetes API or into you know other objects running on Kubernetes. So it's kind of... It's not just running, but it's also like interacting with it. All right, so how does this all work? How do oper what are operators made of? How do they work? How do you make one? That's what we'll talk about a little bit next. Um, one of the beautiful things about Kubernetes is the fact that everything kind of goes through the API is that you can also extend the API. And controller, oops, sorry, got a little excited there. Operators are, the operator pattern is basically made up of two components. So there's controllers, which is a thing that already exists in Kubernetes, and custom resource definitions, which is also a thing that exists. So you are going, in the case of an operator, it's it is a custom controller that's specific to your application, and then a custom resource definition. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a minute. But what that custom resource is, is so Kubernetes knows what a pod is. It knows what a service is. It doesn't know what production-ready database is. You can't say, kubectl, get production-ready databases. It's going to be like, I don't know what that is. But we can tell it what it is by defining these custom resources. And then we can use this controller to watch for changes to those types of resources and then handle whatever events happen. And that's kind of what we're looking at here, which is this operator pattern. So over here on the far left side, you've got your Kubernetes API. Um, the custom resource is going to be whatever that instance is of your, your complex stateful application. In our case, we're going to keep calling it production-ready database. And then you have the controller, which is doing those two important tasks, watching for events. That events could be like, I've asked for one of these to be created, or I need to update the version, or whatever else your, your operator is going to do. And then it runs this reconciliation loop, and one of those events happens, it's going to say, okay, well, show me what the current, what did, what did you ask for? What's the current state of the system? And now it has that operational knowledge built into it, that logic of what to do when an upgrade needs to happen or when a new one of these needs to get deployed. That's all built into this controller, um, which is deployed as just a container image. And so it can do whatever's necessary. And I, as the user who has said, I'm going to use this operator, I don't need to know any of that knowledge. The operator knows. So that's pretty cool. And then um, that handles everything for you. I'm losing my voice. This is great. Um, all right, so here's another way of kind of visualizing it. Um, the white 
rounded rectangle is your Kubernetes cluster. This thing down here on the bottom with the red circle and the lightning bolt symbol is your controller. So it's sitting there, it's just watching and waiting. And then uh, we're going to have our, our custom resource. So you can see here, instead of kind being pod, like we saw at the very beginning, um, instead of being one of those you know, built-in primitive types, it's production-ready database in this case. We still have some metadata, but what's unique and interesting and is specific to our application, to our um, production-ready database, is what's in the spec here. So we're telling it we want this database to have a cluster size of three, we want two read replicas, and we want a particular version to be running. So when we, um, when we apply that, then the controller, which is listening, is going to, that, the arrow in the little circle, that's do whatever it takes. It's going to do whatever it takes to bring up those three um, instances of that production-ready database. So the operator is handling all that for us. So, I don't like to talk about things in like an abstract way. I wanted to give a, a real example. So we're going to look at um, kind of a demonstration of deploying and using the etcd operator. If you're not familiar with etcd, it's basically a distributed key value store. It's also what Kubernetes is using as its primary data store. So it's used for storing um, and replicating like information about cluster state in Kubernetes. So here's an example of what our etcd cluster um, res custom resource would look like. We're telling it that we want to have a size of 3 and a version of 3.1.0. Um, and like we already talked about this before, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but here's that observe, analyze, and act kind of loop that's going on here. So then here's an example of what that might look like. Let's say you started off your etcd cluster A has two pods in it. One of them is running version 3.0.9. One is version 3.1.0. If you remember, we actually want three members, and we want them all to be running 3.1.0. So that's what we find out. OK, what's different than our desired state? Um, it said, okay, well, the version needs to be different for one of them, and we should have three members. So then the operator is going, to, it knows what to do to get us that additional uh, member brought up and make sure that everything is upgraded to 3.1.0. I, as the person who just wants that CD running on my cluster, don't need to know how that works or what it's going to do. It's just going to happen for me um, because the operator has that knowledge encoded in it. Okay, so this... And I always have a hard time controlling this from this side, but we'll hopefully get this right. I'm going to show you this video and talk you through what's happening, and hopefully that's clear enough that you can see what's going on there, but I'll, I'll say it out loud anyway. Um, and I may pause at a couple points to give a little more detail on what's happening, but this is an example um, that's also very similar to something you can find on learn.openshift.com, where you can go through this in an interactive way yourself of deploying an etcd operator and then actually using it um, once you've got it up and running using etcd. I'm clicking. Okay. Right here. All right. So we're going to start here by running create, and we're passing in, there's several YAML files already kind of queued up for us. One of them here is the CRD, so that we are letting Kubernetes know what an etcd cluster is. Um, then there's some RBAC stuff that has to happen. So we need a service account, we need a role and a role binding. These are just things that the etcd um, cluster needs in order to run. Um, so this is kind of like housekeeping stuff that has to be done first as part of the setup. Every operator is going to have different requirements for what it needs. Um, to have running on the cluster before you can use it. So we're getting our role and our role binding set up. And then now we're going to create a deployment that has the container image for our etcd operators. This is that controller piece that we talked about. It is deployed as an image. So now we've got that done. We'll check that it was created. I want to be able to pause here when it's time. Okay, so that's running, and now we see that there's a pod for that is running as well. So now our controller is running. Now we can define an actual etcd cluster uh, by referring to that custom resource. So we're, ooh, pause, did I get it? Okay, 
So let's see if we can do it like this. What you're looking at here, um, we ran count on this file here. So this, you can see that we've got a kind as a CD cluster. Kubernetes is going to know what that is now because we have already defined it. Um, and we're telling it what we want in the spec. We want size of three and a particular version there. Now that we've looked at the file, we can actually create it. So we're passing that file in to create. And what that's going to do is create that etcd cluster on our Kubernetes cluster. So we can verify that that worked. Because now we can pause. Now we can actually run something like here kubectl get at cd clusters, and that's actually going to return something for us because now our, our Kubernetes cluster knows what an etcd cluster is. And it's telling us, yep, there's one. It was created nine seconds ago. And then what we'll see next is the pods getting created. So there should be three of them because we said we wanted a size of three. You can see it's bringing them up, and eventually, soon here, you should see there's, well, there were three in running state. Now, let me pause. So three of them came up. We want to make sure that this actually worked and it's not just like magic, right? So a um, little bit of magic because there's actually another terminal window that you can't see here in this video because I couldn't do them side by side. But from another pod in our cluster, uh, we are connecting to our etcd cluster um, using the, the command line tool for that. And then we are going to put something in the data store and then get it back out just to prove to ourselves that this thing actually works. So that's what's happening now. So we'll write a key and a value. And then get it back out. And so at this point, all we've really done is deployed that etcd cluster into our Kubernetes cluster using the operator and then prove to ourselves that it works. So what else can we do? Well, let's say, pause. OK. Let's say that we want, instead of three, um, Three members in our, our etcd cluster. We actually want five. We need we need that for some reason. Um, all we have to do to make that happen is change the spec. Tell it that we want five instead of three. This command looks long, but all we're doing is a patch where we basically are just updating that value for spec from three to five. So that's what's happening here. And then we can watch as the whatever actions the operator needs to take to make that happen are being done. So we can observe as those two additional new pods are created. So you can see they're starting to come up. There's the fourth one there in running state, and then it's going to bring up the next one as well. So this is kind of a simplistic example, but it kind of gets the point across of, of how an operator works and what it can do. Um, we could have also gone through the process of updating the version, but for the sake of not having you watch a very long video, um, we'll stop that right there. So as I mentioned before, you can you can do almost the same exercise yourself. If you go to learn.openshift.com slash operator framework, um, there are maybe eight or nine different um, learning, interactive learning scenarios related to operators that you can try out. Um, there's one, I think, on just like an overview of the Kubernetes API, if you need a refresher there. There's this etcd uh, operator tutorial. And then there's ones using the operator SDK, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, to create operators using Ansible, Go, I think even Helm, um, and some other things as well. So it's a really great resource if you want to try it yourself um, and get your hands dirty a little bit with, with operators. And you can use operators today. Let's say you don't, you don't care so much about, you know, getting in the weeds, but you want to see what kind of operators are out there. Operatorhub.io um, is a place where you can find a bunch of um, Kubernetes operators that have been built by the community. Uh, anything you see there will also have information about how to actually deploy it on your system. And um, there's quite a bit of stuff there. So you can check it out. If, if you're working on things that make sense to be an operator, <coughs> excuse me, um, and you want to make those available to, to others to be able to use, um, there's information about how you can actually get your operators that you've developed on this list as well on that site. All right. 
So we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about some of the like tools and things out there to help you if you are um, building operators yourself, perhaps, um, or managing them on your cluster in a slightly more advanced way. So the operator framework is basically like an umbrella over some other pieces that are available to you, other projects. So those projects are the operator lifecycle manager, which is, you can think of it as kind of an operator for operators. So where an operator is used for managing the insta installation and lifecycle of Kubernetes applications, the operator lifecycle manager manager manages the installation and life manages the life cycle of operators so it's kind of just like a level removed um, Operator metering is available to let you see kind of like usage reports and, and metrics and historical um, information over time, if that's something that's um, useful for you. And then finally, the operator SDK. So if, if you are in a situation where it makes sense for you to be building an operator, um, the SDK can be a useful tool for you. So you don't have to use the SDK in order to build an operator. You can just do it um, however you want, but the SDK is kind of nice because it's going to um, provide you with some scaffolding and code generation so that you don't have to do it all from scratch. Um, so it will have kind of scaffolding there for some of the common use cases for operators, you know, installation, upgrade, what have you. Um, and then you can fill in your logic for your actual application and use case there. Um, the SDK supports creating operators with Ansible, with Go, and um, I believe Helm as as well. Um, different, slightly different capabilities for some of those than others, but all that support is there. Um, it also provides you high-level APIs to kind of hook into some of the things in Kubernetes so that you don't have to, basically, so you don't have to do as much of this stuff yourself. Um, but of course, if you wanted to create an operator using Python or Java or whatever, you can do that too, even though there may not be SDK support for it. It's not going to stop you from doing it if that's what you wanted to accomplish. Something to note, because when I talk to people about operators, I get this question a lot, is kind of like, do they all have to do all of those things? No. Um, there's this whole kind of capability level or maturity level um, continuum here for operators. There's kind of broken into five phases. Um, it could just, that's kind of hard to read on the far end there, but that phase one is just a basic installation. So maybe you've got an operator and all it does is install whatever your application is. Um, and it moves on in complexity from there. Uh, phase two, it's, it's doing upgrades. Um, full life cycle would handle maybe backup failure recovery. Um, insights, maybe that's handling some of these more like metrics, logging type of stuff. And then phase five, which is listed as autopilot here, is doing all of this, doing everything. Um, it's not necessarily the case that your operator needs to be handling phase five to be good. It's just what what actually makes sense for what you're trying to do. Um, but it's nice to know if you're on Operator Hub and you're using a community built operator. It's nice to know kind of what which of these things is it doing. Um, so this is kind of like a nice framework for being able to talk about what capabilities does each operator have built into it. All right. Um, I really flew through that there a little bit faster than I thought I would. Um, I have some resources I want to share with you. So we, you can go on GitHub to Operator Framework. That'll have links out to the SDK, to metering and the lifecycle manager, as well as some other resources as well. Um, there's a nice site here. Chorus has a nice like subsite on operators. It's got a lot of information, particularly good if you want to share this with somebody, but you don't want to send them to like a GitHub project. Um, and get them in the weeds with the technical stuff. This has got kind of a nice, uh, friendly overview of, of operator concepts. Operatorhub.io we talked about is where you can go actually find operators if you want to try them out. Um, so nice blog post here. And then, of course, on learn.openshift.com, those interactive tutorials are really, um, really good if you want to try things out and get your hands dirty. So we have lots of time for questions. If anybody has questions... Yes. I think they're bringing you a mic. How would, how would you uh, populate data in the database? Because if you have a stateful application, you usually want to have like a starting point that mm -hmm. you're working from, right? So under this whole setup, what would you, 
recommend is the way to pre-populate the data in your in your system. Yeah, that's an awesome question that I don't know the answer to, but I will find out. Uh, I can give you my card after okay. and get back to you. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not going to pretend I know the answer, but I can <laughs> definitely find out. All right, cool. <laughs> we'll Thank you. some recommendations there. I'll just keep the mic. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Is Kubernetes itself using operators to manage its etcd cluster that it uses? So, ooh, I don't know if it's using, to manage the etcd cluster that's just always there, I don't know. But what I can tell you, <laughs> slightly different, is OpenShift, OpenShift 4, is using operators to basically do almost everything. So it's been completely changed so that, you know, installation is using operators, managing upgrades and things like that is using operators. I think there's well over 40 operators just running as part of OpenShift right now, just as like the guts of it, basically. So I know that operators are used a lot there, but I nobody's ever asked me, and I've never looked into it to know if... I'll give you my card, too, and we'll find out, and I'll let you know. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, I have one more. Yeah. Um, so to create a, those custom resource definitions, um, do I need to be a cluster admin, or can I create that on a per project? <laughs> A lot of things related to operators do have to be done as cluster admin. Um, but once you have it done, there's an option to deploy an operator either cluster-wide or on a per-project level. So you can kind of choose that way. If you make, you as a cluster admin can make an operator available for non-admins to actually use if that makes sense. Yeah, but a lot of the, the setup and getting it actually like installed and configured, um, many of those things need to be done by cluster admin. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. If anybody else does have questions, I can give you my card and uh, find those out too. So thank you very much.